All right, here we are live at Rhode Island Comic Con, and it's the Professor Bud Young with Al Mega. Wepa, what's popping, people? All right, we're right broadcasting live all day here from Rhode Island Comic Con. We are right here in the center of Artist Alley. We're sitting around with a lot of famous artists and local. Uh, There's a lot of independent artists here, actually. Uh, yeah. You got T.J. Sterling from Ray Comics. You you have uh, actually up the aisle from us. We have Bob Layton. We have Rob Liefeld. We have uh, a whole bunch of different, uh, uh, pretty uh, top tier talent here, which uh, be interesting to hopefully get a chance to engage with. Well, obviously, fans first, let them have their fun, but hopefully, we get a chance to talk to them. But yeah, yeah well, what we uh, we have our friends from our podcast. We got Joe St. Pierre is here today. We have our friends from Altered Reality uh, Comics. Com- comics actually got two comics. Right, uh, they have a new role warrior. That's something called Argonauts or something like that. Did you see on Ian's table? I didn't see it, no. Yeah, you definitely check it out. The artwork on that reminds me a lot uh, of early Teixeira and Ghost Rider. It was, really? It, yeah, I was like, whoa, wait a minute, this is them? It was really nice. I mean, you know, awesome guys. You guys are, are doing great at AR. Yeah. Definitely, guys, if you have a chance, pass by the AR Comics booth. I believe they're aisle 600. Aisle 600. Yeah, because we're at 400, uh, close to Case Crusaders, but we're the real Crusaders here. Because if you look to your left, look what's there. What are we looking at? Huh? Case Crusaders. Yeah. <laughs> we're the real deal, folks. Yeah. It is what it is. So this is a different setup than we've had the last couple of years. Uh, we're down here. There's Artist Alley along with a bunch of the different vendors. They have the celebrities that are upstairs this year. Yes, then- yes. They left uh, no celebrities down here at all. Uh, only the only uh, people on the main conventional floor are actually creators. Uh, and vendors uh, of all assortments, you know, book vendors, print vendors. But the artist alley, at least, is respectably sized this time around, hmm. and it definitely helps with the traffic flow. Yeah, you know, like in the last couple of years, I thought, you know, the, pe- the reason people come to conventions, there's two different reasons. You come in for either the artists and the and the and the superhero comic book experience, or you're coming to see your favorite celebrities, right? Exactly. Yep, so, yep, yep. I, you know, I, I think there are some people that come for both, but I think that uh, for the most part you're either one or the other right yeah absolutely but if you ask some of the creators here they actually would have appreciated to have one or two actors down here just to bring some you know extra little flow of traffic hey guys the actors are not just upstairs you could you know see two or three downstairs you know great right so uh and then, of course, this is the first year that they've actually spilled over into the Omni Hotel. They're doing um, Apparently the panels. Apparently, they've been spilling over slowly, but this year they've actually been able to take up a, a pretty dominant space at Omni, from what I understand. There's a lot more going on on that side. And for those particular events, uh, well, well, it's too late now if you're hearing me, but you <laughs> needed to get a special red uh, tag on your badge in order to have access. That's interesting. Yeah. So this is a, so they've they, they're doing things a little differently than they have in past years, but uh, for the most part, it hasn't had zero impact on the crowds here. No, absolutely. I mean, yesterday, you know, it's, it's Friday. People get out of work. You know, there was it was a nice uh, a flow, nothing crazy. But right now, it's already you know it's early on in the day, and it's already looking like yesterday, all day. So I, I could only anticipate that this would get uh, much larger. And this is is it. Uh, it's, it's pouring out. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Oh, definitely. Cats and dogs. Jeez. We were leaving that this morning, and I was wondering if that was going to have an impact on the crowds or the cosplayers. But uh, Maybe the cosplayers, but I don't know. The crowds are lined up out the door and around the corner. I, I just start pissing. People got to grab some free goodies over here. Free. <laughs> it's free stuff. <laughs> Yeah, folks, this is what I have to do. This is the hustle of Comic Crusade Undercover Capes. So you visit booth 456, you have the opportunity to get a bunch of free books that were donated by Lion Forge, Valiant, IDW. Uh, we're going to have a giveaway with items donated from Diamond Collectibles, Toyverse, uh, Viz Media, Impact Theory. A bunch of, it's free if you want to grab one. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> grab one. Grab a, grab a, a button, a lanyard, grab a comic book. So... Al Mega hustling as usual. Yeah, this, is what, this is what we got to do. Spread the love uh, of fandom to other fans, and hopefully they'll engage. Grab. It's free. Doesn't it cost you a thing, kid. And also, hey, I don't know if you guys are going to be here long, but at 3 o'clock, we're going to have a free raffle. I have a bunch of cool stuff, toys from Diamond and whatnot. And if you just pass by at 3 o'clock, and give, you, know, you know what? Also, give us a little follow on Twitter or yeah. something, or on social media. Sure. But that's all it is, and I'll give each one of you an opportunity to win. All right? So there you go. So, Daddy gets one, and the two kids are going to get the opportunity as well. 
All right, you pass by at 3 o'clock, we're going to have a whole bunch of cool stuff to give away, all right? So you're listening to Al spreading the Comic the Crusader thing. love yeah, here at Rhode Island Comic Con. Yeah, Any one of these comics as well, you'll get one of each of you like. And there we go. That's why you got to spread love to the children. <laughs> so, so Al, you, you mentioned it a, a few minutes ago, but um, but we've had our uh, our partners kind of uh, really come out in force, supporting uh, us, supporting uh, us, and supporting the fans. So, so why don't you run down the list? What do we What do we got? Who supported us? Who sent stuff? Who are we shouting out? Uh, we're shouting out right now. Send a book. We're shouting out Lion Forge. We're shouting out. You're welcome, Valiant. We're shouting out IDW. We're shouting out Extreme Sets, Crisis in the Toyverse, Diamond Collectibles, Viz Media. Uh, all these partners actually went ahead and stepped up. Um, we had Hip Hop Bling sent down some flyers as well. Um, who else? Oh, we actually have in-house support from Geek Fest, in, uh, Film Fest. Uh, we have one of our fellow crusaders pitching in and helping them out today. So Fantastic. yeah, they're showing us love and support. So definitely, folks, uh, you know, check out all those brands I just mentioned. They obviously are appreciative of you guys by by providing us some freebies for you. <laughs> I mean, this is a true story because if you could see our booth right now, it is just chock full of just free stuff. Free, uh, ab- absolutely free stuff. We're going to say be, free uh, though; they leer at you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know want your soul. <laughs> the, the, uh, Rhode Island Tax Authority is going to be coming up. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a funny story, folks. He <laughs> mentions that we're giving away free, and they try to tax us on free almost. <laughs> I, I told him initially, this is free. And he said, did you fill out the form? Thank you, bud, for being here. <laughs> this is the, the Donald, he wasn't listening to me. Donald Trump's America. He <laughs> <laughs> would have taxed you on free. <laughs> I think they tax us on the air we breathe. This is why it's so stuffy in here. <laughs> Remember, guys, 3 o'clock, come back with some freebies. My pleasure. Have a fun day. Yeah. Folks, that's what it's about. We got. I gotta keep. I'm gonna start pimping. I'm gonna leave you over the butt. Uh, keep chatting with the folks here. All right. All right. Al Mega hustling up. All right. We're here live at Rhode Island Comic Con, and I am talking to. Oh, thank you. Joe Marhofer from Blade Fan Comics. Almost. Can you hear me at all? Ah uh, yes, I can. <laughs> all right, fantastic. All right, I'm talking to Joe Marhofer from uh, Blade Fan Comics. Uh, Blade Fan Studio, actually. Blade <laughs> Fan Studio. <laughs> it's excuse right. me. And we're talking about his new comic, uh, Gas Mask Suicide. So, tell me about it, Joe. What's going on? Uh, Gas Mask Suicide. Um, this is something that um, I started back in 2012, just out of scratch. Um, it's about this kid named Ethan, who just got really tired with the gothic scene and he just started to like explore to see what else the city has to offer so that's where he just discovered the uh the punk rock scene and um at the time he was like still wearing a gas mask for reasons that he wanted to like keep to himself like he didn't want anyone to know about a secret and later on people start to notice that like whatever he does for example like if he jumps off the stage to go crowd serving and if he lands on his neck nothing happens to him like he can't get hurt he cannot die because um, later on it turns out that um, he's actually a vampire and every time he would say his name is Ethan people would mistake that his name is actually Heathen with an H <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, that's interesting what so what uh, so you came up with this idea in 2012 uh, yep and this is your first your first book um, it's, uh, yep, my uh, first self-published book um, with Blayfin Studio. Blayfin Studio, that's something that um, I started with uh, my friend Brian Rose. We uh, met at college, and um, at this uh, drawing class, like, we noticed that, like, uh, we are both, like, good at, like, drawings. Like, I, my stuff is, like, something more of, like, uh, underground style. His is more, like, anime. So we got together, we started hanging out, and then... One year later, he um, told me that, yeah, uh, Province is having this thing called Rhode Island Comic Con, and that's where uh, we started uh, Blakeman Studio, and we started like making our own uh, comic books, our own original stories, and we just took it from there. So, uh, so is this uh, this is where you come? You 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 come here exclusively to sell your book? 
Uh, yep, uh, to sell my book, and um, I also sell uh, some poster prints. Uh, Brian also sells some poster prints as well. And um, as the years have gone by, we're also like focused on making other comic book titles. Like for example, uh, Brian came up with two titles: uh, one called Dream Sprites, um, another one Dragon Fruit. And besides from Gas Mask Suicide, um, I'm working on another story um, called Prey System, which is like more serious type of story because like because gas mask like that's more like a like a comedy story um if you would compare it for something like uh, for example like Beavis and Butthead but for something like Praceism it's more like a like a serious story that has like um a horror genre so it's like a, a mix of like the zombie apocalypse and the style of French horror that sounds like a wicked cross like cross connection there <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, who were your biggest influences in comics? Were you always a comic reader? or? Um, well, growing up, um, some of my favorite comic book creators um, was, I'm trying to remember his name, uh, the person who did the um, miniseries for Venom called Venom the Mace. Um, I'm sorry, I have a hard time remembering his name, but anyway, like, just his artwork, like, that's um, what influenced me to, like, um, become like a comic book artist and over the years I've also met well I actually this year I actually met um, Jim Lee at Boston Comic Con did you meet Jim yeah I did um, I actually was like I wasn't there as a vendor I was actually there um, just waiting in line just to, like get his autograph so he signed three comics that I had um, one was um, a comic book he created when he was with Image Comics uh, the first issue of Wildcats and the other two comic books that I have signed were um, the early um, X-Men issues that he worked on. And at the end, I gave him a drawing of a uh, grifter that I illustrated. I'm like, yeah, so this is for you. And he's like, thank you. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh, yeah. So uh, would you say uh, Jim Lee is probably one of the bigger influences? Uh, on Jim Lee, work? another one, Todd McFarlane, um, one other person, uh, Mark Bagley. Um, he was one person that worked on Amazing Spider-Man in the early 90s, so he was also one of my early influences. So, so were you a big Marvel guy? Sound like you were a big Marvel guy. Um, <laughs> yeah, like Marvel, like uh, for like uh, mostly like uh, the visuals, but when I got into high school, my art teacher, he recommended me that um, I should also look into DC Comics because he told me that DC is really known for like having like um, good stories. So like for me, like as a comic creator, like, um, because I also have to do like some of the writing, then yeah, like that's that's another thing that I had to look into. But when I got to, to like um, high school, um, I actually was focused on like um, DC Comics's mature books, uh, the uh, the Virgo line. So some, for example, like um, I got to Watchmen, V for Vendetta, and another book called um, Why the Last Man. So something for like uh, for mature readers. Right. Right. So. So it sounds like, you know, you said you have more of like an underground style, so it kind of stands to reason that maybe like towards like a Vertigo or a Mature Reader titles would be more kind of towards your style than uh, than like the superhero fair. Oh yeah, because like the the, uh, the stuff that I do, like um, it's not really like um, superhero related, but um, I was at uh, Boston Comic Con 2015 and I had some people that asked me, if I do, if I make any books that are like superhero related, and I, my answer was just like, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody asked you, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if I'm actually am planning on doing something that's like um, that has like uh, has like that superhero tone, um, as of now, like um, I can just like reveal the name of the title. It's called um, the Viridian Mask. Oh wow. That sounds interesting. Oh, thank you. Um, so, I, I so uh, this so this this as a comic creator, um, sometimes I worry. I wonder how independent artists such as yourself feel about uh, like DC or Marvel work. It's they're not really creator own. Like anything you create, pretty much stays at Marvel or DC. Is that? Does that kind of turn you off a little bit as far as being able to create um, for? Yeah, yeah, like in a way, like uh, when I was younger, um, I have pictured myself as a kid, like working with Marvel and DC, like almost any other kid today would. I mean, like who, who wouldn't? 
But um, also, like, years ago, like, people, like, were, like, talking to me and they're warning me about, like, oh, well, um, if, if you make this character, then, like, uh, this so-called company, like, they're just going to own everything. And, I'm, and I was just like, oh, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but as I got older, like, um, when I got into college, um, I was just um, exploring, like, um, are there comics, like, from, like, from mainstream to um, independence, just, like, just to, like, get some ideas of, like, how, like, other people do what they do. And, um, yeah, and, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, Joe, where can we find you online or for maybe if uh, any of our listeners want to get your book and they're not here at Rhode Island Comic Con, can they go somewhere and get it? Um, if people want to find uh, my books, they can uh, find it at my table. Um, it's uh, booth number 448. And uh, the name is under Blake Fan Studio. Um, I'm trying to find a way to like sell my comic books online. But as for my friend Brian Rose for his books, um, Dream Sprites and Dragon Fruit, they can actually find that at Amazon. And I was actually involved with those two books as a editor. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And you have a website or an email uh, address? For, for our website, uh, we're still working on our website for Blake Fan Studio. Um, as of now. People can find us on Facebook, so it'd be like www.facebook.com slash playfanstudio. Um, I also just started a, I opened up a Instagram page earlier this year, so if people want to find me on Instagram, it would be under Joe Marhofer Comic Art. All right, and we're with Joe, Mar uh, Joe Marhofer from Blade Fan Studio. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, back with Joe Marhofer, and we're actually adding on to our interview that you actually uh, created music to go along with your, your comic. Is that right? Uh, yeah, for, uh, for Gas Mask Suicide, because um, it's about a punk rock story, um, I decided that I want to include music that, goes, that went along with it. So um, between 2017 and 2018, um, two of my friends, um, along with me, uh, we decided to get together and we created uh, like our own original music that was like a mix of punk rock and metal. And um, we recorded eight songs uh, last year. This year, um, I recorded the vocals with me as doing the backup vocals. And my friend, uh, Kevin Rachel, um, he's like the lead vocals of um, our band. Um, it, oh, one more thing, am I allowed to curse? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Okay, uh, it's not that bad, but uh, the name of our band is called Hobo Shit. <laughs> Hobo Shit? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, I see it. So, um, and you said eight songs? Uh, yep, it's a total of eight songs, and uh, the total um, length of the CD, our demo CD, it's um, about 11 minutes long, because one song that we have is like literally 14 seconds long. The name of that song <laughs> is called The Tears of Emo, which is basically an an anti-emo song. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we should listen to this CD while we're reading Gas Max Suicide? Oh yeah, that's optional. I mean, um, at my uh, booth at Rhode Island Comic Con, you can either buy just the comic it itself, you can buy the demo CD itself, or you can buy both. It's really optional. But um, after, so since we uh, released that demo CD based on my comic book, Gas Mask Suicide, uh, my friends and I were planning on making new songs and hopefully eventually uh, we'll make a full length CD and hopefully we'll also release a vinyl record. Oh, nice. And uh, and they can go on to hoboshit.bandcamp.com? Uh, yep, that site. Um, if people want, they can listen to the songs for free and if they want, they can also go to that site and download um, each song. Oh, okay, great. So, uh, so I'm gonna listen to this while I'm reading your your comic book, and uh, you know I'm gonna send people over to your table. All right, thank all right. You. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Right. Bye bye. All right, uh, hello again from Comic Con in uh, Foxwoods, Connecticut, and we are live with Joe Saint Pierre. Joe is the uh, artist of the most. Issues of number one Spider-Man's most number 
Uh, we only have one mic? What kind of production is this? Al Mega, you're fired! I'm on a budget. <laughs> Yeah, we're, uh, we're working on a, on a budget here, so. <laughs> so, Joe, how's everything going? How's the con today? Uh, it's going well. I just wanted to uh, clarify what you said. Yes, I am the artist of the most number one issues with Spider-Man or his cast. So, thank you. So, the show is going great. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, busy as heck. I kind of, uh, we kind of came in early today, so I got to see, like, the early bird specials and the line was like, I don't know, half a mile long going through the casino and stuff. So that was a good sign. It's very cool. Are you having fun? How are you enjoying it? <laughs> so Joe's going to do the interview now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is the first time that we've had a table and the first time that we've kind of really had an outlet for people to come to us and talk to us. And that was pretty cool. Getting uh, people coming by and saying, hey. You're the, you're the trial, so that's why we're a little jumpy on this. You're the trial interview, however. We've had people come up to us and approach us from other podcasts and whatnot, looking to network and work with us, you know? I, Sweet I podcast, so I don't know what. Does my pony tell me and I smoke weed? Come on, guys. <laughs> weed, weed Wednesday with Al. <laughs> that's actually a great idea, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> we should just hold it in the middle and just kind of... Okay, yeah, we'll all, like, huddle together. Uh, so, Joe, you just came out with a new edition of, Zo uh, of Zodiacs, a second printing, right? Shut your mouth. Yeah. Of new yeah. Zodiacs. Yes. And uh, those have been selling pretty well? Uh, this is a good show. We did well last year as well. Uh, I sold a bunch of books here last year. There's a lot of comic fans here, so it's very cool. Uh, some shows are different than others. You know, you might get one convention that's more about like the celebrities one show that's more about people who buy prints and stuff like that so i like shows like this one because there's comic fans here and i like to cater to the comic fans to spread the word so yeah we're selling uh second printing of new zodiacs here at the table and uh, we're doing pretty good i also did the excuse me being rudely interrupted I also did the cover to the AR, you know, every AR show, Altered Reality Show, they have their own comic book that corresponds with the show. So I did the cover to this show's comic book, which is called Altered Reality Team Up. And that's not the first time you've worked with Altered Reality. You've done some interior work too? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I've done covers, if not, uh, if not interiors, then covers to, I think, every one of their projects. I could be wrong about that. Have you designed any of the characters for Altered Reality? They have not asked me to do that. I think Ian Chase Nichols, he's the guy who's the mastermind behind the universe. He does the uh, designs and writes the stories for the, st the universe, basically. Cool. Um, so what, what, do you have, uh, what do you have on tap? I know you're working on new, new Zodiacs material. Um, any window on when we might be seeing more new, new Zodiacs? Um... <laughs> uh, it's in the works constantly. I mean, there's not a day go by that goes by that I don't jot something down, but I'm currently working on a book series for Simon & Schuster uh, featuring uh, the Cousteau family. It's kind of like an educational, environmental uh, graphic novel series with uh, you know, Jacques Cousteau's um, grandson, Fabienne. So uh, I'm working on that, uh, finishing that up. Actually, I'm doing the coloring, the last few pages of coloring now. So um, as soon as that gets off the table, then I can jump back onto New Zodiacs. But if you follow me on the social media and stuff like that, I'll definitely keep everybody updated on uh, New Zodiac stuff. Nice. Nice. So uh, where are you going to be able to find that Jack Cousteau book when that comes out? Is that going to be available in mass outlets or...? should be, uh, you know, like the Barnes and Nobles in the, uh, do they have Borders books anymore? No. Amazon, that kind of stuff, wherever you buy normal, regular books, I suppose. That's, uh, that's awesome. So that's Simon & Schuster? Yes. And we'll probably be able to find that more readily than we can find almost anything else from... Probably. You know, as far as comic book. a big deal, actually. Um, we'll see exactly how big a deal it is, but it seems like it's very promising, so... Fantastic. Uh, what, uh, what else you got working on? Anything? 
Wow, where else? Um, no, New Zodiacs, I think that kind of keeps me busy. And uh, that's enough, isn't it? Come on, bud. Give me a break, will you? <laughs> God. Well, I don't, I don't know. Like, this is, the, this is the first time we're live at a con, so it's kind of, uh, kind of nerve-wracking for us, too. So uh, did you be able to talk to any of the other creators? Um, my buddy Bob Layton stopped by. We're across from each other, so I got to say hello, touch base with him. Uh, he's the guy, one of the guys responsible for my very first gig at Valiant Comics in the early 90s. Oh, it's so because so, so, he, he was... Uh, Bob Layton kind of co-created Valiant with Jim Shooter, right? Uh, Bob and Jim and uh, Barry Windsor Smith designed uh, pretty much the entire Valiant, the classic Valiant universe. Yeah. You had heavy involvement in the creation of Ninjak in Valiant, right? I had no involvement with Ninjak at all. I did do. I did, uh, <laughs> covers. That's why I, asked. From that I, uh, I did do an issue of Secret Weapons where um, Ninjak appeared. It was a very early appearance, I think, before he actually got his own title. So maybe you're thinking of that. Okay. So I wrote and drew a story where Ninjak crossed over with Secret Weapons. And I created an arch enemy for him named Scratch, which no one remembers. So. <laughs> yeah, but with the with the new Valiant, you never know. They they starting to dig back into older material. So ne never say no. Never say you no. know, never know. Scratch is a great character. If nobody else uses them, I'll I'll retool them for my own universe. It's very cool. So. So how did it, how exactly did Bob Layton hire you to do uh, to do Valiant work? Well, um, back in those days, it was before computers and the internet and the whole thing. So the way that you tried to crack the industry was you would make Xerox copies of your work, no matter whether it's pencils or inks or whatever. You would make copies of that on a copy machine and send them in by mail, by st snail mail. So uh, I had been doing that for a number of years, trying to crack the industry. And uh, I remember... S pretty vividly seeing Valiant Comics just first appearing on the shelves like the early issues of Magnus with um, Jim writing, Jim Shooter writing and uh, Art Nichols and Bob Layton doing the artwork and I was so impressed by that stuff it, it gave me that kind of old school vibe I was like you know it was so impressive that I wanted to know more about Magnus Robot Fighter and Solar you know Man of the Atom so I was like, geez, I'd love to work for this place. So I sent out samples to them on a Monday, and I got a call on Wednesday. I didn't even know the post office worked that fast. So, I, I mean, literally, like, less than two days later, I got a phone call with a job offer. And, uh, you know, long story short, they offered me Rye, uh, who's my favorite character still to this day, my favorite Valiant character from that universe. So it was a, a pleasure to start. Uh, working on that. Now, with um, with Rye, were you working on uh, Bob Lane's character designs, or did you design Rye at all? Or? No, I, I had no uh, had no design input on Rye per se. I mean, he was pretty much already a character, and he was in the flip book. The Magnus issues five through eight were uh, kind of a flip book with a kind of a Rye mini series on one side and Magnus on the other side. So. He was already an established character, someone I was reading and interested in anyway by the time that I was working there. But I did create like several of the villains and the supporting cast for the Rye regular series. So you're, you're taking me back now because I remember reading all those Valiant comics back uh, 30 years ago now almost, right? Don't say 30. <laughs> Is it 30? God, it's close to that. No, no, it's more than 20. Way more than 20. 92, 92. That, that's 27 years ago? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, Feels like yesterday, though. So, uh, I mean, so you were kind of right, like right there down at the ground zero of the early days of Valiant. Um, now, what do you see now when you see um, Valiant kind of almost maybe being the next... Uh, kind of like a Marvel Cinematic Universe where you got Bloodshot starting to film and maybe, you know, maybe someday we'll see Rye. Maybe someday we'll get Secret Weapons. 
What do you think? Yeah, that'd be cool. I know they re retooled Secret Weapons recently. So, um, yeah, maybe there's a, a resurgence there. You know, I co-created the series with Bob, and um, we co-created Livewire and Stronghold together. And uh, it'd be cool to see them in the movies. Uh, I hadn't really thought about it until you asked me, but yeah, I, well, that would be great. Well, you know what? I want to uh, I want to go with you to the premiere of the Secret Weapons yeah. movie <laughs> when it comes out. But uh, you know, yeah, this is cool. what I live for. I live to give you good you ideas and make you think about stuff. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Let's keep doing it. All right. Brainstorm. All right, Joe. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. I know that this is kind of a kind of a weird setup for us. Usually, we're kind of uh, talking on different uh, situations, but you know what it is? We're not used to talking face to face. I know. That's what it is. It's it's the, the whole Skype. expression stuff. And, you know? Yeah. You know, now I'm not sitting here naked behind my desk. Now i got to be dressed <laughs> and talking to Joe. Jesus. That's too much information. <laughs> All right. A real loud metal for you. All right. Well, Joe, thanks for being the guinea pig, and we're going to be gonna be talking to a, a whole bunch of people today, but I'm glad you're the first. Oh. It's great to hang with you guys. Always a pleasure. Cool. All right. Thank you, Joe. And make sure to pick up Astronaut Inc. stuff right now. All right, uh, back again here uh, at Comic Con, and I'm sitting here with Ian Chase Nichols from Altered Reality Comics. And uh, Comic Con is run by Altered Reality Entertainment, correct? That's right, yeah. Um, Altered Reality Entertainment uh, started its own publishing, uh, not the last Rhode Island, but the one before that with uh, The Road Warrior. And they've been expanding with a book at every show, and we're going to be doing creator own and all kinds of other stuff. And uh, we're working towards getting our books in diamonds, so they'll be in shops and getting them all up on uh, Comixology. Um, that way it's just more out there and available for people who can't make it to the show. Has, uh, has this kind of uh, well, uh, ex exceeded your wildest expectations as far as having like creating kind of like a universe inside of a, uh, like a comic convention system? It's been completely different than what I expected because we get... At the Altered Reality shows, they're not entirely artist-driven. There's a lot of celebrities, so we get a lot of people that aren't necessarily comic fans at the show. And one of the, like, I don't know if you'd call it like a, a, a I don't even know what to call it, like a singularity of what we do is just that we have people that have never read Spider-Man or Superman, but they've read our books because they've never read any other comics. Like, they come in, they get the ticket that comes with a comic book, and they go home, and that's the only comic they have, and they read it. And we've had people that have come to the events we've done at the P. Bruins games where we've done comic book giveaways. We created original books for the Providence Bruins, a character in the whole shebang, and uh, gave them away to, I think, the first 3,000 people that were there. And we had people that came from that first Rhode Island show that loved that and the other books that came out uh, subsequently, and they wanted to keep collecting the books. So it was pretty cool. We had a whole like peewee hockey team that came by, and they were like, we love this stuff, and it was really cool. Have you seen any uh, altered reality cosplayers? <laughs> no, no, we have not. Um, but um, you know, we have a lot of people that there's. I don't know. There's so it's such a tightly knit community because you see these people at the shows regionally that come back and keep coming back, and it's you know, our, they're our friends and they like what we do or they don't like what we do, but they support us and try to help us really you know do what we want to do in our careers and you know I hope they like the books. I mean, you guys gave us a phenomenal review on the uh, most recent one. Uh, Brian, I think, wrote the review. What's his name? I believe that was it. Yeah, and it was just super nice and said some maybe not entirely deservingly level nice things. I don't know. I, I just I have a hard time taking compliments, so it's just, you know. Well, I have to tell you here at Comic Crusaders, all of our reviews are honest and upfront. We don't try to butter anybody up, so if you write a bad book, we're going to tell you. Oh, well, you know, we've, we've gotten lower reviews, like lower lower ratings on stuff, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm not questioning your integrity or genuine stuff, because I read, uh, Comic Crusaders is a site that I go to. Uh, you know, your podcast, and uh, it's you guys, and then another one that's local that we've been friends with, and that's I don't, I don't really read the other ones. I just don't. Me neither. But <laughs> um, I was going to ask you something really profound. Um, yeah, I totally forgot it. This is so. This is the danger of having like kind of like a live podcast here at a con, which we've never done before. 
So having a, it's usually safer when we're on Skype and we don't see each other. Yeah. But having face to face, it was you know, I did the same thing with Joe, who I've talked to a hundred times. <laughs> we and love Joe. We yeah, love um, so yeah, so uh, so I guess oh, the question I was going to ask you for Alter Reality, um, what's in the works? What do you do? You have coming something coming for Rhode Island Comic Con? Uh, we do have something coming for Rhode Island Comic Con. We have a, a, a new, I can't say who it is, but we have a phenomenally talented writer writing a new issue of The Road Warrior that will be out there. It'll be the, the first solo issue of The Road Warrior since our first book, because she's shown up in some of the other stuff, um, but this is really another step into what we'll be announcing there. And um, we've got that. We have another book coming out for Colorado Springs Comic Con. Um, it's What's that? The Lark? Uh, um, it's, 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 an, it's, you know... It's close, um, but this one is about another character that was in that first story, um, Ms. Marauder, and we got a a uh, wonderful artist who's done a ton of stuff for the big two over the years, Valiant, uh, won an Emmy working on the Spawn TV show, Mike Vosberg, um, he's doing the cover, he's doing a six-page chapter on the inside that I'm going to be inking, um, and he actually asked me to ink it, which was really cool. Um, yeah, it was a very high compliment for him to ask, because he inks his own stuff now, and he does a great job, so I'm unnecessary in that equation. <laughs> so now, what's coming up? I know you're going to San Diego Comic-Con with that from New England Comics, representing for the Tick. Yep, yep. I'll be there. I'll be at the New England Comics booth, and it's been in the same place for 30 years now, and it's right across from where Neil Adams is, and it's like catty corner to the DC booth. I did the uh, San Diego Comic-Con exclusive book, which they are not just calling it the exclusive this year. It's actually issue zero to the new series, and uh, I'm going to be doing some stuff on the new series. They haven't announced what I'll be doing or anything, so I can't go too far into it, but I'm just excited to actually work on like the main book. I've been doing a lot of... Uh, specialty one shots the free comic day issues uh, convention exclusives and stuff but this will be like you know the book so but i know that i mean we've talked a lot at different conventions and everything but how did you actually get into comics um as a fan or as an artist start with the fan and then go into the artist uh i was born in connecticut when I was about six years old, my old man, uh, there was a, in Mystic, Connecticut, there was a restaurant called Twin Sisters, and it was a sandwich place, and on the corner, there was a newsstand, it was an old newsstand, it had the spinner rack, the cigar smell, everything else, and just saw a comic book there one day, and I asked my old man if I could get it, and, you know, we didn't have a ton of money back then, but he just said yes, like, out of the blue, like, you know, when your kid's asking for stuff, and you're like, no, 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 but... <laughs> But he just, and I took it home, and I still have it to this day, and I, I've, I've read it a hundred times. It was the, the Marvel Holiday Special from 1991. I can quote the book. I can tell you all the creators that worked on it, and I've actually taken that beaten up one around and gotten it signed by people that worked on it, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's, uh, that's awesome. I, I have my own story that I won't get into with everybody that, that listens to my podcast knows all my stories on how I got into comics. Um, how did you get into it professionally? I was very lucky that um, when I moved to Ohio, I had to move because my dad's job. We moved back out to Ohio, moved out to Ohio, where actually where my parents were born, and there was a just the local shop published their own books, and I had been doing fine art as a little kid, and I we had friends of the family that were artists, and they had taught me you know painting and drawing and stuff, and I was going to the shop, and I said, you know, I draw superheroes and stuff for fun, and I've done some comic pages. You know, do you ever hire anyone or do you ever have anyone, like, do stuff? And I was just hanging out there. And that's actually how I met someone who's here because he was at the same store is uh, Nate Lovett, who uh, has done a ton of stuff. And uh, Daryl Banks, who worked on DC Comics forever, was a, a customer there that would do the occasional artwork for him. And I've suge said it to most retailers, if you can afford to do it in a day and age where you have printing available to everyone at a low cost and low minimum quantities if you can at all afford it there are artists in your store every week even if you don't know it they're there rubber chicken comics put together a rubber chicken comics presents you see it around a little more and more and that's how the tick started was just a store publishing a book and that's how i got it i remember that i remember i was a i used to go into new england comics when i was a kid and the tick used to be in the newsletter before he ever got his own comic book, he used to show up in the newsletter. Yep. Absolutely. And, and it's just a wonderful way 
for young artists to come together doing anthologies and having people in the comic store in the it's a different perspective for retailers as i'm sure you've had retailers on and if they're able to add something or say something that they think is missing from what they're selling it's always really cool and they always have different ideas like i did some books that i look back on them and the art's not great but we tried our best and we did some different stuff and that's pretty pretty fun to look back on now you did you've done some covers for idw and everything too teenage mutant ninja turtles and power rangers right uh ninja turtles ninja turtles ghostbusters ninja turtles and batman uh power rangers gi joe yeah i did a larry hama issue gi joe uh cover um and then there was a recent one called cyber specter which was um Scout Comics. That was that was a recent one. Any uh, any chance Marvel and DC going to come knocking on your door someday? <laughs> Maybe someday, but they have no idea who I am right now. So that doesn't, you know. I, I was lucky that the Batman TMNT was through IDW, and I'd done some stuff for them. So that was kind of like the side door to getting to do something for DC. Oh. High hopes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I never say never. Not anymore. You, you, in this industry, you get to meet people you grew up idolizing i've been fortunate enough to like work on because i loved the tick and ninja turtles as a kid you know maybe someday i get to work on them and i got to do that and it was just i can't say that it couldn't happen but you know this industry more than any other is more kind of like a um it works in mysterious ways right i mean and you get to be so close to the creators that you grew up loving Absolutely. and that uh, and then you know then you get to see them coming up too so that's that's great. Um, but, Ian, uh, thank you so much. Is there anything that you're working on that you want to talk about? I think you pretty much covered it. And I was just glad you guys could be at the show and we could hang out. And, you know, I, I love the podcast. And it was that we talked about it. You did that Jeopardy with Joe. And I just couldn't believe the questions. And I have to say that 13 gave you some hard stuff to work on. Well, 13 was supposed to be here today, but he had to back out. I know. And uh, I'm sure he's probably going to kick himself when he hears this. But, yeah. He's, he lives for that stuff. So, yeah. But, Ian, thank you so much for the invite. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to uh, just share the weekend with you guys. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Well, we're at day three here at Comic-Con in uh, Rhode Island, and we are talking with Brian Rose from Blade Fan Studio. Uh, artist on uh, Dream Spirits and Dragon Fruit. And uh, how are you today, Brian? Oh, pretty good, thank you. You? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, so, where? Uh, t- talk to me about Dream Sprites. How did that? How did that idea come about? And uh, why don't we give me a history of uh, of, of uh, how you got into the business? Well, uh, with Dream Sprites, it was about trying to come up with a new idea. I kind of the Stan Lee there with uh, something that's never been done like when he was coming up with Spider-Man for example like Spider-Man never done before <laughs> and uh, what I came up with is I realized Native American culture really isn't getting enough exposure oh, on for television sure. or comic books and I thought this is pretty nice uh, I would really like to show this stuff more because I really liked it uh, when I read it in the library as a kid like the and I came up with the Sprite is loosely based off of uh, Guiding Animal Spirit. So it's, with this, it's actually a psychic familiar. It's like a part of yourself. Okay. And their powers are based around your personality. So if you want to know the character, like, um, my character, Tabby, he's a Dream Sprite. He's got super speed, super strength, and he shoots energy slashes out of his, uh, his feline claws. And above all, he hates to be called Puss in Boots. Oh, fantastic. So, um, so now is this a self-contained story, one book, and that, and one and done, or? Oh, this is uh, the first three chapters of the series. Okay. I'm working on volume two right now. Uh, I just finished the storyboards, and I'm working on the rough draft right at home. Okay. How long does it take you to create something like this? Well, the first chapter was 60 pages. I originally did a full color, and it was digital, and I noticed the lack of response with it. So I just and considering how long full color takes. I decided to do all black and white because it was also uh, cheaper, more cost-effective for, for people to buy it. So, did you uh, did you take lessons of, from people in the business or get advice on how to exactly do it, or you just kind of jump in both feet and kind of uh, figure out the pitfalls as you went? 
Well, I've been drawing since I was a kid. I love drawing Garfield, Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, I mostly taught myself. I took basic art classes. Like um, my most recent was CCRI Community College of Rhode Island. And um, I haven't had any professionals really train me or anything. Me and my friend Joe, we basically figured this all out together by looking around, asking people stuff, uh, online communities, things like that, or um, YouTube tutorials. I've had. Sometimes I've even just made a couple phone calls. How long have you been coming to Rhode Island Comic Con? Uh, we came to the original one back in 2012. With these books? I didn't have those books yet. First I did like a one shot, like the ninjas. It wasn't really all that good. I, w I was writing that on literally no sleep, so it wasn't that good as a result. How have you seen uh, the uh, reaction to your work over the past several years coming to Rhode Island Comic Con? Uh, I've seen, actually the first time I debuted this at the 2014 Rhode Island Comic Con, sold out Saturday morning. Really? Yeah, kids loved it. Oh, fantastic. And adults loved it too. That's good. So it gives you the uh, the motivation to create more. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Kevin Eastman himself even asked for, for a copy when I went over to visit him. Kevin Eastman? Yeah, uh, oh, nice. he, I actually uh, talked to him a couple of times and I thought, hey, maybe a professional would be a good way to get a critique and I just wanted to look at it. He's like, he said, I'll take it. Free stuff, guys. Free That's comics, awesome. Free posters. It's all free. Uh, tell, tell me about it's Dragon Fruit. How is, uh, and I is this a new idea from you? or? Oh, I came up with that when I was 17 Whoa. in high school. Anybody okay. want to win for a free so tell me a little bit about this book. Um, it's about my main character, Kai. He is a teenage psychic. He has a variety of powers. When I started the story, it's going to show up his established powers. Like he has psychometry, mind reading. And, um, one of each if you like. You can also do so to you guys. manipulation, don't even fans. though we don't see I mean, too much of that at first. I'm going to tease you a little bit, you know what I mean? Right, right. You can also, yeah. he's actually really, he can, grab that. he's an empath, so he can feel other people's emotions. So there's going to be a rally. You can grab some posters if you want as well, because it's double sided. And yeah. one of the bigger yeah. things that you'll find out further in the story is how taxing his abilities can be, oh, because yeah. when he goes to school, he's not himself, because he's hearing the thoughts of, like, Everybody around him because he's absorbing all their thoughts as he walks around and uh, touches things. It's it's like that's why he can't get to sleep at times because in the story he starts out being really sleepy. He's got all these thoughts are flooding in his head still. And finally when he gets to sleep, oh, time for school. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Um, so tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about you mentioned that you were doing some voice acting. Yes. Um, if anyone's ever heard of the video game yeah, Reincarnation, it first was books, like independent, uh, really some like congregate, new grounds. Uh, it's about um, how a demon <laughs> in the video game comes to Earth, finds people reincarnated at hell through what's called reincarnating portals. In fact, they're nicknamed reincarnates by the demons. Um, the demon I play, Vile, he hunts down people that have escaped. Checks to see if they're still evil. If, he's con if they've converted to the good side, he can't uh, send them to hell. So if they're still evil, he kills them, makes it look like an accident to send them back to hell where they belong. <laughs> That's great. So anything that anything you're working on currently? You said, you know, talk to me about. You said you, you were taught by Steve Bloom. Uh, yes. Uh, Steve Bloom has a online voice community, Blue Box Studios. It's a community on Facebook for people who are interested in learning more about the voice acting industry and want to get into it. He also does um, paid lessons. Uh, he even offers like catered um, to you, uh, like a what you can do for yourself. But that costs a lot more. So, but the voice acting classes, from what I've been hearing from people, are really good. I want to get into that myself someday. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so, is that? Do you have anything else coming up? You said you have. You're working on the next three chapters of Dream Spray. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, volume two, and it's going to come out next year. I'll keep people posted, and eventually I'm going to have an Instagram account uh, for people to follow too. I'll post them on the Blade Fan Studio page on Facebook. All right, so uh, they can follow you, uh, Blade Fan Studios, on Facebook. Is there any other media they can follow you on? Um, I also have a DeviantArt Art account that I post from time to time. Okay. And um, well, I'll keep that. I'll link that to when I release the Instagram account. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Shout that out. Oh, and uh, to answer, 
uh, the previous question, how long that took. This took like almost a year to do chapter one because it was full color. Okay. But when I did black and white for the next for chapters two and three, that took me four months. Okay. So, so we'll see. We'll see the next book next year, 2019, Rhode Island. Fingers crossed, I can get here. <laughs> Fingers crossed, I can get here. All right. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you too. All right. Hi, this is Bud Young, live from Comic Con, and we're here with Rich Woodall. And Rich, I understand you are uh, involved with the Altered Reality Comics uh, series. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I am. So I, uh, I'm one of the artists on the the current Team Up book, and I've also done uh, a couple other art jobs. And I wrote the Argonauts book that came out uh, at Empire State. The uh, now Argonauts was that self-published or was that that was the uh, that was from Altered Reality Comics. Okay, I think I missed that one. I thought I've read most of uh, most <laughs> of Altered okay. Reality stuff, that was but a one shot. Yeah. okay. So um, so tell me what you're doing on uh, on the personal side. What do you do? Uh, uh, any any work for any of the major publishers? Sure. Um, I've done work for Dark Horse Comics. I had a, a book called Kyra Alien Jungle Girl that was running through uh, Dark Horse Presents and then had its own trade. Um, I've done a cover for IDW for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Powerpuff Girls and Jim and uh, and, and I have a, a Patreon that, that I that I do that uh, right now it's running uh, I did a book a long time ago called Johnny Raygun and uh, right now there's a Johnny Raygun Savage Dragon team up that Eric Larson approved and uh, so that's all running on my Patreon right now. Um, I'm kickstarting currently right now a book called Space Force. And tell me, tell me that Donald Trump helped you with that. The president came up with the idea all on his own, and I just ran with it. Um, and if you go to the Kickstarter, there's a video where the president talks about that, about uh, the only way to fund Space Force is through this Kickstarter. So. If you want to see Space Force become a reality, you can go fund it. <laughs> I think we need to donate it to Rich Woodall's uh, Kickstarter for Space Force. Uh, Thank you. you. Um, right now, I've got a couple pitches out to a couple different publishers. Uh, a horror anthology um, that's got a, a slightly different twist to it where it's got a main story running through the anthology that kind of kind of spawns some of the, the anthology type stories um, and then uh, there's the Space Force thing uh, the the Patreon thing I have a, another book that, that was on Patreon that will probably be kickstarted soon called Sergeant Werewolf which is uh, it, it's, it's, it's World War 2 werewolf action horror <laughs> weird comedy yeah. it's, it, it's fun anything I do I try to make it fun Rich, how did you get started in comics? Oh boy, uh, this is a long story. I was 16 years old. I'm now 43. Um, I uh, I was at a Boston Comic Con and I heard somebody say editor. I turned around and I knew that I needed to show this guy my portfolio. He was a small press guy, uh, Saeed Dabinga. He ran a, a small press uh, company called Red Mercenary Comics. He gave me my first work, but more importantly, he took me to comic conventions all over the East Coast and introduced me to a ton of people and, and really got my foot in the door. Sounds like he believed in you a lot. He did. He did. And I'm not sure. I think it was more that I had a car and he didn't. And I could drive anywhere. I could drive anywhere to any con uh, at 16. And um, But he was very nice to me. And, uh, and uh, even though I wasn't as talented as I thought I was, he... he took a chance on me anyway. That's awesome. Uh, who, are you, uh, who are your biggest influences in art? Uh, Jack Kirby's number one. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge uh, Silver Age Marvel fan. Um, Sounds like I need to have you on No Prize Podcast. Oh, absolutely. I, I, will, talk, I will talk Silver Age uh, Marvel forever. We, the, the Johnny Reagan comic I did is my love letter to Silver Age comics. It's, it's just goofy, fun... Mar I, I, I once read that John Byrne said, "If I can't draw, or if I can't do the X Men, I'm going to do Next Men." You know, and I kind of took that to heart, saying, "You know what? If I can't do Fantastic Four, 
in Johnny Reagan, I'm going to create my own Fantastic Four. And I created uh, these characters called uh, Dr. Oog, who's a caveman that comes from the past, but he's the, uh, the evolution made him brilliant. Uh, but he's a jerk, <laughs> and, you know, and he's got a son and a wife, and, and they make a little super team. That's my little Fantastic Four. But, yeah, I just like to do fun things, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I know where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not one of these guys that can do a big book, but uh, I, like to do, I like to do create our own stuff. It sounds that all the ideas you're talking to me sounds like a, like a lot of fun. It, it's a lot of fun. It, I I have fun with it, and and I hope uh, I hope other people enjoy it too. All right, Rich, thank you so much for being on uh, our podcast here at Comic Con, and good luck. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, thanks, Rich. No problem. We are here live. At New Island Comic Con, day three, Sunday, we're quickly uh-huh. wrapping up, and I am here with Athena Finger, the granddaughter of the immortal Bill Finger, co-creator of Batman, and we're going to chat a bit about her grandfather. Fine. Okay, we're good. All right. <laughs> Athena, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Well, I'm fantastic. Um, so, I was just uh, I was just telling Al that... I didn't even know you were here for a couple of days, and someone said, Athena Finger, Bill Finger's granddaughter, is like four tables down from you. Oh, really? They didn't, you didn't know? I'm in the program. I don't have a picture, but I am in the program. And, you know, it's not like you don't have, like, a unique name or anything. That's I they, don't know many other Athenas or Fingers. <laughs> or Athena Fingers, so... <laughs> so, um... So now you're kind of you're kind of in the business now too. You're doing artwork. I am. I've been doing um, renditions of old time covers and a few of my own creations also. So awesome. Yeah, I'm slinging art with the rest of us. And now, <laughs> now, now, was that an industry that you kind of wanted to get in because your grandfather did it, or was this kind of an industry that you just kind of fell into? Um, well, as a child, I was always creating art. Uh, I went to art school for a little while in high school. Um, I was going to go to art school for college, but life pulled me in a different direction. Um, and I recently got back into it about two years ago. Um, when, how old were you when you kind of realized what an influence that your grandfather had on the comic industry as a whole? Um, I don't recall an actual age because it was always kind of there. Um, I was pretty young when my father told me about it, though. I, mean, I would say probably kindergarten is when I start remembering it, and um, you know, it was always known in the family. That's, a, that's interesting, and I know that you've uh, you've done a lot in the past couple of years of, uh, of being instrumental in getting your grandfather's rights uh, back from from DC. You, got, you have them added on to the creative line. It's now Bat, Batman created by Bob Keeney and Bill Finger. Well, actually, they use the word with. Um, with, okay. Whatever, everybody sees the word and anyways. <laughs> um, yes, so in 2015 was when we actually got official credit for Bill, and that's when his name started to appear um, permanently with Bob Kane. Can you, can you walk me through that a little bit? Um, well, you know, my, it's not a lack of trying from my father when he was alive, trying to get his father's name attached to the Batman title. Um, but for whatever reason, DC, you know, kind of fought them on it and said they couldn't do it. So then after my father passed away, it kind of fell on me. He passed away in 92. I was still a minor at the time, so I didn't really have any course of what to do. And so um, for about 15 years, I didn't really do anything as far as pursuing getting credit. I wasn't in until about 2007 when Mark Tyler Nobleman was writing his book about Bill that he was like, listen, you should start pursuing this. This is, you know, the fans know about it. You know, I didn't know people knew who he was. This, yeah, you know what? Because I've been a comic fan for over 30 years, and uh, Bill Finger's name, to me, I always knew about it, but he never got credit on the books back in the 30s. They, I mean, they, it was always Batman by Bob Kane. Right. 
which I mean, I was told, and I've learned a lot in the last several years also, that, you know, that was kind of the industry norm that only one person's name was put on the title, <laughs> and then there were all these wonderful, talented people working behind that one particular name, and that, you know, the Superman boys were a unique situation where there were two people's names on the title, so, um, why Bob Kane didn't follow the lead of what the Superman boys did, considering that was the reason why he created Batman, was because he saw that Superman was so popular and that they were making money off of it. Um, but again, you know, it was the industry norm, and Bob Kane could have added Bill's name at any time, but decided not to. So, I mean, it, it kind of was what was happening, and it took a long time for it to be added and corrected. So. so so for the fans that might not know, what are what are your grandfather uh, biggest additions on to uh, Bob Keane's uh, Batman? Well, I mean <laughs> what we say is that anything that you like about Batman came from Bill. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, Bob Keane's version of Batman looks nothing like what we see today. Um, but, Bob's version was in a bright red suit with a tiny little mask and big stiff wings. It looked nothing like what we have now. The blues and the grays and the blacks and the cowl and, you know, the real dark pointy ear looking like a bat with the cave scalloped and all of that. That really all came from Bill because he, you know, being a writer, if you're going to play with a word, you need to make the character look like what you're describing him as. And so he, he played with that and he really came up with the scheme of what Batman looks like now. Um, so and and he was instrumental. He created Robin and the Joker. Oh, he came up with all Batmobile, the great no, yes, all of the villains, Gotham City. So, the backstory of how he became Batman. He came up with, came up with Pennywise. He came up with again anything and everything that you love about the character really came from Bill because he's the one that was creating the whole mythos. He was the writer. Right. Um, without the writer, what, what did you really have? It's, and especially back then, I mean, nowadays when you got more of a collaboration between artist and writer, um, a lot of it back then was the writer. Right, and he was so visual with his writing. He would leave notes for the artist of what the panels should look like to go along with what he was writing for the character. So he really was like very visual of what he wanted to be portrayed with his words. So I have a question about Robin. What? Okay. What do, do you know? What led Bill to create Robin initially? Well, I mean, the times were very different in the '40s. We didn't have all this inner dialogue. I mean, if you were talking to yourself, you were considered to be a crazy person. <laughs> so he's like, you know, it's really tough for me to write for Batman if he doesn't have someone to talk to. So he, they came up with the Robin character so that he had someone to actually converse with other than one his five, inner dialogue. One, nine, so five. that was how that whole character came about. Um, and Jerry Robinson came up with the whole and Boy Wonder and naming him Robin and all of that. So again, having that collaboration with the character, right. not just... You know what? Uh, I'm going to put you on to something new. One person coming in. Impact theory. Steve, right. I hope he's new. Uh, so so one, tell me about the Joker because now the Joker was also Enjoy. Bill's creation well, as well. Well, you know... All three of them, Bob, Bill, and Jerry, all claim credit. So again, I think more along the lines, it was a collaboration. They all like, put in their own you know, idea of what this true villain Batman was supposed to be. Uh, you know, Jerry says he brought in a Joker playing card. Uh, Bill was influenced by movies a lot. So The Man Who Laughs, and that character with the very big grin. And uh, Bob saying that he got the idea from some poster or something from Coney Island. So I think it was really just like the three of them really getting together and saying, what, yeah, then what can we do? This is by Jody Hill. Like a really you know, kind of weird, gruesome, entertaining kind of villain that's really going to you know, keep Batman on his toes. I do. 
I did get the feeling of Batman on more than anything else was more of like, what do we do Who's this little month little? to top last month? Right. Little, 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 it's always little, how are they going to one up the, the previous book? So, right. and I think that's where a lot of those characters, you know, became so full of life because they really realized that oh. What we, like you said, what are we going to do this month? I mean, last month we had, you know, Catwoman. And the right. month before that we had the Joker. What? And, and what are we going to do now? So he like you really needed like a box of gimmicks or something. To well, you know, that was Bill's gimmick. Actually, he had a gimmick book. And he was meticulous about his research and, and what he was going to put into those stories. And so I mean, you know, one of his known things is the oversized props and, and all of you know the larger than life type of characters. Right. That's, this is awesome. Um, so walk me through now when you initially uh, you decided to go to a lawyer and, and fight for the rights to get Bill added onto the credits. Uh, well, I mean, it's tough. I mean, I had an attorney for a little while. And, um, he wasn't really pursuing anything. Can't get out of it. You're not for a music, while. Steve Aoki. This is um, brand new comic book. And then it came to the point where we were approaching the 75th anniversary of Batman. And I'm like, listen, I know we have you know, so much time to actually pursue this. Um, and fortunately, my sister is a lawyer. When she was in law school, her you know, main focus was copyright law. And so she made a lot of wonderful connections when she was in law school. And she was able to help find people that were going to really help us gain momentum. So we could approach DC and say, you know what, we're not the only ones that want this, the fans want it. It's time for Bill to get the recognition. You all know what he's done and what his contribution to the comic culture is. So how are we going to make history right now? Right, of course. So, I mean, it was, you know, I, I'd say it often that timing played a huge role in this and that, you know, as the old timers retire or die off, Deadpool's all the, the fans one, took so. over DC That's and they really knew and that. understood what Bill did for the comic industry. Right. And they really did want to see him get the recognition and the credit that he long overdue was deserved. And so I think that really played a huge role in him getting his name attached and getting the credit. I think he was one of the last, uh, the last major unsung heroes of yes. the comic industry. Yes, because right before that was the Jack Kirby case that was settled, right. which How? was another one that was robbed of all of his <laughs> so, out. And that one, so so that the, uh, the Kirby case plus the Siegel and Schuster's going over right, the but they've been fighting since the '40s. Right. And how much? Um, how much of an influence did those cases have on? On yours, did it intimidate you a little bit? Oh or? No, I think that it it was just going along with that, you know, the, the industry changing and really recognizing and wanting to give the credit to these people who really, you know, created a whole culture. Two five zero. I mean, we're sitting at a comic con with thousands upon thousands of people. Right. Without what these men did, we wouldn't be sitting here doing this or talking about these characters that people really have attached themselves to, really have a connection with. Did you see how many uh, Batman cosplays that walked oh, around so today? Many. And even like there's some Robins and, and everything. And the Joker, and, yeah. I've seen quite a few Riddlers. And, um, a lot of Harley, even though Harley was created on yeah, the animated three, series. Three, but still, I mean, there's, four, there's so much from the Batman like, mythos that the people the really love. Really, you know, again, they, they associate with these characters and they connect with them. It's a. Uh, it's it's truly truly amazing the influence that that your grandfather had on the comics and uh, now going forward you, I mean you see like it's going to be probably classic Batman movies coming up. This is actually a video game. Robin, Robin the, the new Teen Titans uh, show that just came out. Uh, there's a Joker movie in development. It just it just seems like ongoing and it just is. I don't think Batman's ever going to go away. Yeah, no, I don't think so either. I don't think so. He's our modern day mythos. Um, just like you know, the Greeks had Athena and Zeus and all of them. We've got Batman and Superman, and you know, even with Marvel, the X Men and Captain America. And these are these are stories that really tell you know great values that people want to aspire to have. So, you know, I don't think they're going anywhere. Um, so I think next year is uh, Batman's 80th. Yes. 
Any, any big plans for Batman's 80th next year? Um, I, I haven't heard anything formal, but I am planning to go to as many conventions and talk to as many fans as I possibly can. <laughs> so, so we need to develop a bigger, higher profile for you yes. for next year. That would be great. Maybe, uh, I would love that. I would love to. So we're gonna we're gonna get in, uh, get in someone's ear about maybe doing a bat, an 80th Batman panel next year. I, I've actually talked to a couple of my friends, um, trying to see if we can get something put together for San Diego to do the 80th panel. Um, if they're willing to do it, I might approach them for the New York Comic Con. Um, it depends on which locations I get books for. Yeah. I'm hoping to not just do 80th you know, anniversary. I know it's not Marvel, um, I'd like to talk about some other things. Okay. I myself am an artist. How, right. do you, how do you come out from the shadow of having a famous relative and how do you make your own? No, and fantastic. things like that. So I'm trying to figure that out. Plus, I'd really like to do like a GoFundMe or something for Bill to get a star on the Walk of Fame in Hollywood. I think that would be fitting for the 80th anniversary. And I want to pull the fans in for that because I know that the fans are really wanting a piece of the Bill Finger story and be involved in every way that they possibly can. You know, well, without the fans, I wouldn't be here. Athena, I'm going to totally offer our help. ComicCrusaders.com, UndercoverCaves.com. We help Kickstarters and FunBees all the time. Okay. Um, we'll, we can shout that out. Um, we have, we're all fans of the industry, and we all love Bill. And a Walk of Fame star, I think, is, is perfect. But I would I love think to. So too. Um, we, we, we're all about comics education too. Okay. And I think, um, I think having someone that's that, that knowledge, as knowledgeable as you about your grandfather and can talk about the start of the comic book industry. Well, because he didn't just write for Batman. I mean, he created Green Lantern, he wrote for Superman, he wrote for Marvel, he, you know, wrote for movies and TV and radio. I mean, he really took the work wherever he could get it. And he was, you know, he had a brilliant mind. He really did. He was very imaginative. And he had a lot of influence on a lot of the writers and artists that we have now. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds it sounds to me like that uh, that he still has so much to offer to us as a lesson. And, yes, know, for sure. For I, I, I agree with that fully. Well, I, I'd love to continue the conversation, perhaps either on a fuller podcast where, you know, you're not, where, you know, four tables down trying right. to do no, your own I thing. I would love that. I would definitely. F- fantastic. So, um, so we'll be in touch with you about, uh, about the... The GoFundMe. Okay. And we'll, we'll be, I'd love to help you with it. That would be wonderful. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank- Visit UndercoverCapes.com for the latest and greatest podcasts via the Undercover Capes Podcast Network. Also, visit our parent company website, ComicCrusaders.com, all about comic pop culture.